January 20th, 2009 is a date that will go down in history, almost 100 years after the formation of the NAACP and 51 years after the signing of the Fair Housing Act, an African American was sworn in as the 44th President of the United States. I'll talk with the leading civil rights professor about the significance of his presidency and with a longtime Obama supporter who witnessed history firsthand. All this and more today on Time. Good morning. Welcome to On Time. I'm Kai Jackson. History was made when Barack Obama was sworn in as the country's 44th president, making him the first president of color. Now that he is a leader of the free world, how does this affect race relations and does it render the civil rights laws obsolete? Well, we pose these questions to our respected civil rights professor, F. Michael Higginbotham from the University of Baltimore Law School. Welcome back to In Time. How are you? I'm doing very well, Kai. It's great to be here, and it's exciting times and frightening times in a way. Let's talk about your observations of the inauguration. Where were you that day, and, and what were your thoughts uh, as an African-American man seeing another African-American man sworn in as president? It's actually um, an incredible uh, time that we live in. No question that uh, in the American story, the election of the first black president is, is a fundamental, uh, monumental development in the American uh, history. And it's just, uh, it's just an amazing time. Uh, in a country with a long history of slavery and segregation, the first black president um, is just uh, one of the greatest stories ever. It is an incredible story. And let's go back and pose the question to you. Uh, does Barack Obama's election and inauguration as president render America's civil rights laws obsolete. Yeah. A lot of people have suggested uh, is racism over? And uh, the short answer to that, uh, in my judgment, is it depends on what the American people do. We have a tremendous opportunity. But the question is, what will we do with this opportunity? Mm. We've had three uh, opportunities like this in the past. The formation of the uh, country, the creation of the original Constitution, the Reconstruction period, and the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. Which were e really monumental watershed moments in American history. Watershed moments in American history where tremendous progress on racial equality was made. Mm -hmm. No question about it. F uh, creation of the uh, Constitution, we had an opportunity to end slavery. Mm -hmm. We did not. In fact, it solidified. During Reconstruction, we had an opportunity to create racial equality with 13th and 14th Amendments. But we had the response was segregation. Right. And then in the Civil Rights Movement, we made tremendous progress in the voting area and in education. But there has been a backlash uh, during the 80s and uh, 90s. Right. Uh, we, we saw particularly with uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, issues with set-asides. That was a big deal down in Virginia. No quotas, no set-asides, things of that nature. These were programs that had come to help uh, African-American entrepreneurs who knew the playing field wasn't level, uh, but politically it became a football and, and Republicans were quite uh, unhappy with what they saw uh, were, were, were set aside uh, things for one, one group and they didn't feel that the playing field was level in that regard. No question about cutbacks in affirmative action and clearly uh, when affirmative action was created it was supported by both parties, Republican and Democratic Party. But uh, it has become a political football and there has been tremendous cutbacks in affirmative action as well as other anti-discrimination laws and also lack of enforcement in terms of the civil rights uh, division of the Justice Department. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, President Obama appoints uh, his new attorney general, Eric Holder, the first African-American attorney general. No question are, about Are you colleagues with Mr. Holder? Um, I am not. Uh, I do not know uh, Attorney General Holder, but I have tremendous respect for him. He was a, a great public servant in the Clinton administration, and I think he'll, um, he'll make a great uh, attorney general. Do you believe in any respect, Michael, that the, the expectations on the new president are realistic, or are they a bit over the top? Well, I think um, 
I think ex expectations are very high right now, no question about it. And uh, people are suggesting that uh, President Obama walks on water. And I think over the next uh, four years, we'll see that he is a human being. But also, um, I think he brings tremendous um, opportunity to the job. No question that uh, he's one of the greatest speakers. Uh, if you look at the election he ran, he ran a, a tremendous election. He's, uh, he moves people. Uh, he makes them believe that, uh, that things can be different. And uh, people identify with him. And I, th I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the president. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> this, is, this is not, I'm not being sarcastic mm -hmm. at all. What is it about being an attorney that puts people in such positions of power? President Obama, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama, uh, Tipper Gore, Vice President Al Gore, President Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, yeah. all attorneys. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what's amazing is if you look at the founding fathers, uh, a majority of the founding fathers were attorneys. <laughs> yes. So um, I think a knowledge of the law. And um, if you look at the history of our American democracy, clearly um, the rule of law has been tremendously important in that. And so I think people that value the law are, are attracted to political leadership. Recently, the Washington Post had an article in which they, the question was raised whether or not uh, in particular, and this, this is something that kind of hits me at home, the Civil Rights Act uh, should be null and void. This was signed the day I was born, July 2nd, 1964, and the question has come about with an African-American president, are these, are these rules in the books which basically require, correct me if I'm wrong, states to notify the federal government of any change in their voting laws uh, to be notified. One thing is we, we've talked about states don't like to do, and that's give up any autonomy. Uh, that's, that's a big no-no for them. But by the same token, uh, the Constitution has laws across the board so that all Americans' rights are protected, correct? It, so that is correct. So how do we balance the two here? Do you think the Civil Rights Act uh, needs to be uh, rescinded? I think at the present time we should keep it. I think that uh, we need to recognize the progress that we've made and why. And one of the reasons we've made such progress, one of the reasons that we were able to elect the first black president is because we have reduced discrimination in voting because of these laws. Right. The federal government comes in and protects against that. And uh, that's significant. If we did not have these laws, mm -hmm. uh, I think there might be tremendous problems in, in, in the voting arena. So I think we need to keep the laws presently. What about states' rights? Clearly, states are um, constitutionally entitled to administer to the voting. And the federal government, under the Civil Rights Act, is entitled to enforce. Now, if states drop the ball, that's where the federal, federal government should come in. But uh, states should have the primary uh, responsibility for administering to the voting, and uh, hopefully they'll do, continue to do a decent job. One of the themes uh, of, of the Republican Party in, in recent years and has been for some time is, is less government. With a crisis economically that's global and a stimulus package that goes to Wall Street, that goes to the banks, that goes for the mortgage crisis, that goes for the average homeowner, that goes to the American auto industry, is it even possible uh, beyond even President Obama's first term to have smaller government? And, and what are your thoughts about that, whether smaller versus bigger government is, is a good thing for the American public? Yeah. Personally, I believe that government is there to facilitate um, things and to make things better uh, for, for uh, people. It's, it's, it's there to help. And um, cutting back on government uh, assistance uh, I think is problematic, particularly in these difficult economic times. And I think what you're going to see, uh, I think President Obama will be judged in terms of the success of his presidency um, based upon how he does with the economy. I think there are many other things that he can do uh, that will make him a great president in terms of uh, dealing with poverty, in terms of dealing with racial equality and gender equality and human rights. But I think what um, initially he's going to be judged on is whether or not he can get this economy together. And if he doesn't, he's going to be viewed as an unsuccessful president. One of his very first uh, moves or acts as a president was to shut down Guantanamo Bay. Um, this may have been a surprise to some people, but I doubt it was a surprise to you. Um, one of Mr. Obama's uh, talents, obviously, was, was, was knowledge of constitutional law such as, such as you have. And he was even a professor uh, of that, of the law. 
Did this surprise you when he made this move? It did not. He uh, promised that he would do that during the campaign. And I think uh, he's going to be very careful to keep uh, his promises uh, that he made uh, during that campaign. Uh, he did uh, say he would close Guantanamo. I think that's important. I think it sends a message around the world that um, this is a different president than previous uh, than our previous president, and that changes will be made. That America will lead on the human rights issue. That America will will lead on the civil rights issue, uh, and. The world has viewed us as not that leader uh, in the past. Critics are concerned that what the message that this sends is that uh, America is softening and that this president is naive and does not have a clear grasp of the enemies of the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, President Obama is naive. I listened very carefully um, to uh, his um, inaugural address. And I was, I was moved by the fact that he said, our principles shouldn't suffer um, uh, our, we don't have to make a choice between our principles and safety. Hmm. We should be able to do both. And I believe that President Obama is smart enough to, to make that happen. Uh, I think it's a false choice uh, that we have to choose one or the other. Doesn't we should have not have to do that. That's interesting. Uh, what civil rights areas, in your estimation, are most vulnerable um, right now in, in, in what might what needs to be done to protect them? Yeah. I think clearly um, we have to be very concerned about the current disparities that exist in employment, in education, uh, in housing. We have to be very careful about that. We have clearly made tremendous progress in the country by eliminating um, overt discrimination, uh, government-imposed discrimination. We've done a great job at that, and no longer is that permitted. But we still have tremendous inequalities uh, in, in those areas, employment, education, housing. And I think one of the things that President Obama has done, and it's only been 30 days, but he um, uh, passed the Ledbetter Act and signed it into law. And what is that? And, and that's basically a provision that makes it a lot easier um, to bring a lawsuit for unequal pay. Uh, Beverly Ledbetter was a female who had been um, paid much less than her male counterparts for 20 years. And this is something we've seen historically in the United States. Absolutely. Women not being paid at the same rate men are for the same work. Absolutely. And President Obama signed into law the Ledbetter Act, which makes it a lot easier to bring challenges and to be paid for uh, unequal pay, to be equalized, to have your pay equalized. Um, overall, you're encouraged uh, by the future of the United States despite uh, the economic outlook right now, Michael? Um, I am. I, I mean, Americans are resilient. Americans love liberty. Uh, and, and, and I believe that uh, Americans um, love fair play and justice. And so I think that in the long run, uh, we're going to be successful both economically as well as in terms of racial equality. And the students you are uh, ushering into the profession of law, how encouraged are you by them, by their passion, and by their uh, love of the United States and their commitment to uphold the law? I'm very encouraged. And the reason why I say that is I look at uh, Obama's coalition. If you look at people under 40, um, you had such a, a rainbow uh, of support there. And uh, to me, that shows that we have made tremendous strides. I think you see folks under 40, and they don't seem to view life in a racial prism, like many of the individuals, I think, that came up under Jim Crow uh, were forced to do. Right. And so I think that um, there is tremendous hope uh, for that. And the question is, what will Americans do now? Hmm. Interesting. That's a very good question. It's a rhetorical question. And Hopefully we'll be able to answer that at the future date. F. Michael Higginbotham, thank you so much for coming on today. We appreciate it. My pleasure, Kai. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. You know, some dates are permanently etched in our minds, and as we instantly recall where we were and what we were doing. And right now, a new historic moment in time, January 20th, 2009, 
will be one of those dates that millions will remember where they were and what they were doing when Barack Obama was sworn in as president. I was fortunate enough to cover the presidential inauguration for Eyewitness News while Dr. Carla Hayden, the CEO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library, was one of thousands who got to participate in this historic occasion. She joins us to share her observations and reflections. Welcome back to On Time. Oh, thank you. That really was a day to remember. Nice to have you here in this capacity. We want to first point out that there's a reason why you have such a, not only just an, an affinity for the president and, and the first lady, if I can use that, in their family, but also a connection. What is that, Dr. Hayden? Well, I, I really was pleased and, and it's wonderful to know somebody that's in the White House, to really know them, because Barack and Michelle were actually neighbors in Chicago when I lived in Chicago. Wow. And I got a chance to work with Michelle um, so you knew with them the city of Chicago before, before they, they were married. They were married before they were married. Before he, he became senator. Oh sure, and he was course, working um, and doing things for Kara Mosley Braun, who was um, the, the former first senator, senator of, of there. Illinois. And just you could you could tell they were a wonderful couple, mm -hmm. and both of them were dedicated to um, the ideals that they talk about now. And that it, it hasn't been a thing that's overnight or anything. It, it really is something that they've lived give, and believed. Give me a, either a characteristic or something perhaps that he said during that time. And we're talking about, I guess, this is not even the early 90s, the 80s we're talking about right. probably. Anything that stands out in your mind, any conversation or just something about his manner during that time? I think what really stood out, and you can see it now, is that he's generally interested in people. Hmm. And so when I moved to Baltimore and I went back to visit and he was asking me, how's it going there and who have you met and all of those types of things. I mean, he would really engage wow. you and you should just talk to him because he seemed interested in you. Hmm. He, he, uh, he's a young man uh, becoming the 44th president of the United States. Are you surprised at, at what seems to many to be a meteoric rise? Well, not that surprised. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just shocking just the, the sure. idea of it. But in terms of a person and their um, qualities, uh, the fact that he wrote a book by himself, um, and that's notable, it's a librarian, you know, I know what yes. it takes, and that he, um, Harvard Law Review, all of the things that led up to it showed a, a great deal of discipline and direction and focus. Absolutely. Um, so your Chicago connection is certainly there. And what was your experience like, Dr. Hayden, being at the inaugural events? Let's talk about that day. First of all, it was as cold as Antarctica outside. It was pretty it felt, cold. It, felt it was like pretty it anyway. cold. And all the people from Illinois were just like, yes, this <laughs> but feels like home. you're very used to being from Chicago. But, but <laughs> I think the, that what really struck me and everyone else that was there, and they talked about it afterwards and talked about it during the day, was the feeling of goodwill mm. between people of all nationalities, uh, backgrounds, abilities people were helping each other out even when things and, and you know with two or three million people things could get a little things crowded get dicey, sure. and there were some missteps in terms of where to go and things like that but everyone kept calm and even if things started to accelerate between two people um, other people would say it's okay this is a good day let's keep this atmosphere going and that was the spirit that was there and people were uh, giving each other cookies if mm -hmm. they were hungry and just different things like that and so and several people said if we can keep this spirit together we can solve anything you don't think that spirit was a coincidence or happens oh no no I think that people were uh, genuinely uh, hopeful and very Pride. There was a lot of pride that we did it, and you heard a lot of that. We did it, right. and like we put this person in, and this right. is who we believe in. So, a sense of ownership. One um, elderly uh, African American woman, after they um, had the Pledge of Allegiance and things like that, um, at the very end there was the, the song mm -hmm. "America the Beautiful," and she just said with tears in her eyes, "Now I can sing this." Wow. Hold that thought. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Hayden about her experience being at the inauguration of President Barack Obama. I'll talk about some of my experiences and show you pictures from a reporter's perspective. Back in a moment.
One of those witnessing history on January 20th, 2009 was Dr. Carla Hayden, CEO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. As head of one of the largest and oldest respected library systems in the country, you can think of another moment, Dr. Hayden, that rivals this moment in history. Is there anything else in your life that was this pivotal that you can think of? Nothing this positive. Mm -hmm. There were other times, and, and several people have commented on that, that for instance, 9-11 uh, sure. brought wow. everyone together, and for an entire week almost, everyone was just uh, just torn and, yeah. and feeling such a ten intense emotion. Absolutely. And that was, but that was a, a, a more on the negative side, sure. and that this was, was so positive, and that they couldn't think of except out of uh, like Woodstock or certain right. different uh, group events that everybody felt so positive. Yeah, and, and it seems to me, and, and they're not connected, but it will allow me that from such a tragic experience as 9-11, uh, not that many years ago, this is kind of an evolution. The United States right. has moved to a new day, and I, and I would imagine uh, that those who, um, those who perished, you know, certainly on the planes and in, in the World Trade Towers, this would be a shining moment in their in their honor and their memory of what America's right. all about, wouldn't you think? And pulling together. And pulling together. And and recognizing differences and allowing for differences and not fighting over differences. Let's talk about a couple of things. A couple of points that, that, that I thought about about this. Would Barack Obama be President Obama were it not for that speech the at the 2004 the Democratic National Convention. I still see that as America. the key moment America. in time in history for United him. States I think so because America. other people had known about him um, locally, of course, and um, within the party and things like that, but the, the general uh, general American public had not really heard him. Right. And when he made that speech, and it was such a unifying speech, Absolutely. I think people were just amazed that here's a person who had this wonderful story, personal story of America. And, and it was that hopefulness that people felt. And they said, oh my goodness, here's somebody that, that is expressing what we think America should be about. In his own self-deprecating way, he oh. joked in that speech, the, the, the skinny kid with the funny name. And the big ears. And the big ears is how he grew <laughs> So up. I think that's what people really related to. And, and I would encourage people, because I did this before I covered the inauguration, the I would encourage people to go back and watch crowd, that on John YouTube. Because reach it's the it's, it's eerie. You see, divide. he looks presidential. At and this that is point. in 2004. He truly does. And you can see something incredible happening. We have some pictures that I took. Um, and there are also some, uh, a picture of you and the, and the First Lady. This is a picture of a family that I just happened to snap. You know, as a reporter, oh. you can't help but go down there with your camera and take pictures while you're doing your work. This is a picture of, of, a, of, a, of a gentleman and a lady buying some souvenirs. Flags were very popular while they were there. Just some more pictures. This is me trying to be artsy. I don't know <laughs> whether or not it came off. No comment, John, please. Thank you. Um, this was very early in the morning, so this probably people were there so you. early. It was so cold, <laughs> but it, but people were there. This is uh, two photographers, Eric Scott with the headphones on, and Mark Masakia. I work with both of them. Uh, they work at WJZ. That's me and Eric Scott. He's been here as long as I have, the last 16 years, and he did an incredible job. And look uh, at all the people. It's, and and the number of people was just, it was just mind-boggling to me. I was there also in D.C. for the Million Man March which gave you a sense of, of a mass numbers of people, but this just eclipsed anything right. we've seen in the history of Washington. Let's get, um, souvenirs, what souvenirs did you get? Well, I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, of course, a puzzle, uh -huh. and it has 504 pieces, Look and it that. has the White House Let's and uh, the a go. little biography, and so you can have it for kids, and you can also for adults or seniors, yeah. but it's, it's a really cool little thing. Mm -hmm. Also, a action figure. A Barack Obama action, action figure. Action figure, and it says an action figure we can believe in. Wow. Okay, now let me ask you a question. I think I would be remiss if I didn't. There's excitement for the president as well there should be. Um, is some of this getting out of hand? Uh, do people need to settle down a bit? Well, I must admit I did get a Mission Impossible or Possible T-shirt <laughs> okay. uh, that's blue, but I think there's some of it, of course, people will try to... Um, capitalize on something like this but I think that having this much enthusiasm and people this excited is a good thing um, I saw a young lady a Caucasian lady that had on a t-shirt that said my president is black 
Wow. And that so that great. you know, so this, this I gotta, is wonderful. I got to stop you there. We're out of time. Thank you so oh, much, Dr. Thank you. Coming on. I appreciate it absolutely. And thank you for sharing your thoughts with us uh, on this momentous event. It, it was it was an incredible experience, even from a reporter's perspective. For more information on the Obama presidency, including books by, about the president uh, by the president, check out the Enoch Pratt Free Library or go to their website, prattlibrary.org. Thanks for watching and listening to On Time on the CBS radio stations. You can now see On Time on WJZ.com. Goodbye, everybody.